I'm being called Justine, I think it, it suits me as well. Um, I'm happy to be here today. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, we've started this transportation master plan in June, and so any opportunity we have to connect with the community and talk about what we're doing and invite people's feedback is really excellent for us. Uh, the community engagement component of this plan is um, a big piece of it, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in future. Um, so, why are we doing this update? Well, the last time we did a master plan was in 2005. And in 2005, we were still using paper maps to get around. Right. Facebook had just come onto the scene. For my generation, that's like, uh, it feels like it's always been around, so it was hard to reconcile that, oh yeah, that was 15 years ago. We were still renting our movies in the movie store. <laughs> yeah. There was no Netflix. Our cell phones looked like this, if we had one. And YouTube had just come on to the scene as well. So this, for me, really put it into perspective how much our world has changed since 2005. So it makes no sense to be relying on a transportation master plan that also dates to 2005 anymore because the way we move around our communities has changed tremendously as well. So if we look at now, everybody has one of these in their pocket, pretty much. I mean, there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, 95% of people have access to a smartphone and all of the apps that that entails. Um, we have, oh, sorry, I don't know how to go back. Go back, go back. I have to do this manually. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe, will it let me? Nope. I got, I got it from here, Jennifer. Can't see it. <laughs> uh, up, 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 slightly up, slightly up. There we go. Thank you, sorry, there we go, perfect. Um, so we've had new services come onto the scene, such as the idea of sharing rides, sharing bicycles, sharing all kinds of things, sharing our files on the computers. And that top left image is um, a rendering of a driverless vehicle because that technology exists today and is actively being tested by lots of private companies and investing investors that are interested in that technology for the future of how we get around in our communities. So any of you who might know someone who has a Tesla or has a Tesla, that technology is already in that vehicle waiting for the opportunity to be activated. So it is imminent, it is in our future, it is definitely within the 15 year horizon of our updated master plan. So these are all things that we need to start taking into consideration and planning for. So our master plan update is looking at three overarching goals. One of them is to reflect the current policy framework so just as everything else has changed in the world, so has the policy that we develop and build our city. So we'll have to bring it up to date with some of those new policies. We're also updating um, the population and employment growth that we're expecting for the next 15 years. So we have new numbers of how many people we'll have in wealth, and we need to make sure that we can have all those people move freely throughout our community. And we're finally also looking at the role of these new trends and technologies that are coming onto the scene. So I wanted to give a quick um, overview from a policy framework perspective because that's not necessarily something that is intuitive or known to everyone in the room, but it's important for you to understand that this plan isn't um, starting from a blank slate. It's informed by a lot of different information that's coming at it from different perspectives. So if you want to think of it as the external pressure is the provincial legislation and policy framework such as um, our growth plans that dictate how much we have to grow and by when and where we're putting that growth. Um, we also have done a tremendous amount of work and of engagement with the community to understand what Guelph's vision for the future, the long-term future, is. And through the community plan, we have a very good idea now of what people want to see in their community, what they value, what's important to them. So we have taken all of that information. That information has also been used to develop the more recent um, approved strategic plan. So that's a four-year plan used by city staff and council um, that is going to be very critical in, in scoping out what work we're going to achieve in the next four years and what we're budgeting for. And so we want to make sure all of our master plans align with that, those, those documents as well. Something else that's really important that was recently adopted is the target for net zero carbon by 2050. That's a very ambitious goal for Guelph but it's one that's critical because I think most of us in the room understand the value, the importance of addressing climate change as quickly and efficiently as we can um, right now. So uh, very happy to see that target be part of our plan as well. So 
So all of those things are feeding into our transportation master plan and the transportation master plan then will give us um, a suite of actions that result in services that are delivered to you, our citizens, um, and policy frameworks to help guide how we build and grow transportation-wise into the future. And finally, it's also going to loop back and help update our official plan for the next iteration. So it's a constant cycle, and these things are always evolving and being updated, and we have to try to keep up with it all the time, but um, it's important to understand how it all works together. So again, just to iterate, uh, the community plan and how, how valuable that is, it's pretty hard to get people to come out and engage because there's so much engagement happening all the time, but this community plan reached a huge amount of our population. Over 6,200 people were spoken to and spoke about the community plan. 4,200 plus act actual like, um, responses to surveys or engagements on the website, um, 5,000 visits to the website, they did a scan of all of the master plans and strategies that everybody in the city of Guelph has been doing and it helped synthesize all of that down into really clear um, values and goals and targets for our community. So that work is very much important and if you were involved in that then you know there's a direct link between that and the transportation master plan. And the vision that came out of that is that we move around freely. It's easy to get around in our neighborhoods, our city, and our region. Transit is a priority. We heard that loud and clear. It's frequent, it's affordable, and it can get us to work and to neighboring communities like Kitchener, Fergus, and Hamilton. So a lot of what we've heard this, this afternoon, it, it feeds right into this, and it's telling us that this is something the city needs to work on and prioritize. It's working with our partners at the provincial level and the federal level to enhance and advocate for those connections and also working within ourselves to make sure that we're providing a transit service that meets the needs of all people in our community. And then our strategic plan has also touched quite a bit on transit as well. Under providing attractive and affordable transportation options for everyone includes transit, looking at making better improvements to workplaces. Um, a lot of our industrial areas in Guelph have transit service but don't have sidewalks or bike lanes. So when you get off your bus, you might have a half a kilometer to walk in a ditch. And so improving transit is also about improving that first mile, last mile connection. So that you're traveling with dignity regardless of the choice of mode that you're using. Improving local transportation and regional transit connectivity, I think that's self-explanatory. And then also looking at new, clean and efficient technology. Um, I don't want to steal the thunder of my colleagues later, but you know, looking at electric vehicle technology and wealth and what fleets does that make sense for? How do we um, support residents that want to switch their, their car over to electric vehicles by providing charging stations in their public facilities? Um, what other infrastructure do we need? And then looking at uh, technology such as the access to big data and the fact that we can use big data to develop apps like the one that Terry was speaking about to um, help us make better choices about how we get around in our community. If we have our own data sets and our own apps for our own residents, then it helps us have more control over that and have more tailored solutions for people in our community. And finally, the official plan. So this is our, our, our 2018 official plan. So this plan takes us up to 2031. It has a specific target for how much we want to increase what we call the mode share of different forms of transportation by that date. And for transit, we want to reach 15%. So that means that every day of all the trips to or from somewhere in Guelph, 15% uh, of those we want to achieve by public transit. Um, as of 2016, that mode share was around 7 or 8%, and that's the, mo the most recent data that I have access to, so that would represent 100% increase in transit trips. Um, so it's quite an ambitious leap to make, but I'm going to tell you how I think we might be able to get there. So where are we right now? Uh, this is just at the conclusion of phase one, where we did a lot of public engagement in our community over the summer and the fall uh, to gather your feedback on what is working well in Guelph, what is not working or causing any problems or can be improved, and then also looking at what your ideas are for improvements to make transit better, transportation better in Guelph. We also have done some background research around best practices and policies and boring stuff like that. And we're starting to take all of that information and look at developing 
what we call a problem statement, or like what is the problem we're trying to solve with this master plan, and develop a bunch of alternatives that we can then evaluate with the community and select a preferred alternative. So when we were doing some of that first phase engagement uh, and that policy, that background research, there's two key philosophies or concepts that we want to explore and we think is going to be a, an important part of our master plan. Uh, the first one is what's called complete streets. So I don't know if anyone in this room has heard about the term complete streets, but basically it's saying that rather than prioritizing the movement of cars or vehicles in our roads, we're looking a bit more holistically. We're looking at moving people and goods. So when you, when you take the emphasis away from cars and you talk about the movement of people and goods, you start to think about how we use that space a little differently. So we might have, for example, a 30 meter, what we call right of way, which is publicly owned property from you know, the house on one side of the road to the house on the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. And within that right of way, we have to fit a lot of stuff. We have to fit underground, all kinds of sewers and stormwaters and utilities and gas mains and all of that. And on the surface, we have to fit in boulevards and street trees and sidewalks and bike lanes and buses and cars and trucks and all of that. So it's talking about how do we allocate that space differently. And maybe differently looks very different than today. Maybe it looks similar to today. Maybe it looks exactly like today. We're going to explore that. Um, but with complete streets, it's really also about uh, protecting the vulnerable road users. So traditionally, safety in terms of traffic engineering means making sure that one car doesn't hit another car. We're looking at it a bit more globally. We're looking at how do we protect our pedestrians. How do we protect our people with um, accessibility uh, challenges? How do we protect our cyclists? Um, is the way that we design our road today adequate to meet those needs? And we're also um, looking at transit priority measures. So transit priority is about how do we move our buses better? Because buses carry a lot of people, a lot more than one car on the road, or the equivalent of those people in a lot of cars. So if we have a capacity concern in our roads, which we are starting to see in Guelph, even though some of you who might live elsewhere, maybe Toronto or, or uh, other big cities might think that that's funny, we don't have a traffic problem, we are starting to see congestion building during our peak hours. And the result is that the, the reality of that is because everybody's traveling by car. And if you can move part of those people by bus, then you're increasing a lot of capacity in our streets and you're moving people more efficiently. So there's different ways that can look. Um, that can look like a dedicated bus lane, which we tried out. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute. It might look like something less than that. It might be a queue jump lane at intersections or the way we prioritize uh, buses approaching a signalized intersection. So again, exploring different um, ways that we can move transit better as well. So we tested some of these ideas out. We did a protected bus bike lane, two-way bike lane on Woolwich Street, just down here, down, downtown, uh, for one week um, to, to, to make this a complete street. So previously, without that, there's no bike facilities on Woolwich Street. Um, it does have transit service and sidewalks on both sides. It has on-street parking and travel lanes in both directions. So we had to make some choices because we're working with what we've got, and this is a temporary um, solution. So the choice was to remove the on-street parking. Uh, we picked a side that had the least impact on on-street parking, and we put in these flexible uh, delineators to protect the cyclists from traffic. And the result was very interesting. Uh, we did surveys. Uh, we had about 300 or so responses to, during that week, and the responses were very positive. Um, majority of people supported the idea. They felt that this enhanced safety. It uh, was clear where road users needed to be, it achieved the needs of different road users, and they would like to see this elsewhere in Guelph. Um, we also experienced some of the challenges that would arise with something like this, like delivery trucks parking in the facility mm -hmm. so that yeah. nobody can get anywhere. And I mean, this is not new. We know to expect these things. These would be the types of challenges we would have to figure out. Um, we also uh, worked through some challenges with mobility services about where they could pick up and drop off mobility, mobi mobility users in a, um, in a way that could be accommodated by the design. And the beauty of this is that people could experience it. We're not just putting pictures on a board and saying, what do you think of this? And everyone's like, oh yeah, that's a beautiful picture. Yes, I agree with that. People used it and then they did a survey and we know exactly how they felt about it. And that is so valuable in terms of 
developing a master plan like this. So then we did the same thing, uh, same idea, a month later on Gordon Street. Um, just to show of hands, how many people drove down Gordon Street while these were up? Okay, so like, just slightly less than half. Um, how many of you felt this was a good idea? Okay, so slightly less than the number of people that agreed, that said that had experienced it. Um, we had over 1,200 survey responses to this one. It was only five days, so it was shorter than the other one, but it really caught people's attention. Gordon Street, as we all know, is a major north-south arterial. It is heavily used by commuters, by business people, um, by transit. It's our highest transit frequency route. Um, and so those were exactly the reasons why we picked it, because we wanted to get people's attention and we wanted them to see and feel and touch and, and experience what it might be like if we were to explore this in future. And um, admittedly, the results were not overwhelmingly positive, <laughs> but we knew that and we expected that and that's okay. And we dug down deeper into those with some, um, some focus groups uh, last week and got to understand the nuances of why there was frustration and uh, disagreement with it. And we learned a lot. Jen, can I just interrupt? Were the responses from just transit users or from the drivers? All road users, but they had to identify what type of road users they were. So 900 and some odd of those were road, were drivers. Okay. And so it was like pilot projects or? Yes. Oh, I see. Just like a five day, Temporary barrels and signs up just to try it out. Um, I just want to say that quick. My husband was driving the car and I knew where it was, but from the sign, he thought it meant that there were two of us in the car and we could do that in like. HOV? Yeah. So, like, no, we didn't do it as an HOV because. No, that's what it looked like on the sign. Like, he's driving for us. I said, no, no, that's yeah. one of us. He said, yeah, but. So he thought because two of us in the car, we thought that, that's okay. Yeah. That's that's okay. okay. <laughs> exercises, I mean, they're incredibly time and resource intensive to, to plan and, and implement something like this, but the value of the feedback we get is is a hundred and immeasurably better than just having an open house and, you know, getting people who have the time to come out and give that feedback. So I think, um, I think we did the right thing here in trying to test it some of these concepts. And some of the key takeaways is that change is hard. And if we need to change the way we move around in the next... 15 to 20 years, it's not going to be easy. It's going to mean having to make some difficult decisions and helping guide ourselves through that transition. Um, it also means, it, it also helped us understand exactly what it means to have a fixed amount of space and what you can really do within that. So starting to have some more discussions around complete streets and the, how do you make those trade-offs and who do we want to prioritize and how do we find the different balance of moving people. Um, we learned from the focus groups that both drivers and transit want to see a couple of things to make transit more attractive, and that is reliable service. I don't think there's any surprises here. Reliable service, fewer transfers, more frequent buses, make travel time closer to driving time, um, and separation between bikes and buses. That was a big um, thing that we've heard, not just in the context of that, but just in the context of transportation in general. Um, road users of all forms would love the separated cycling infrastructure. Um, we're also exploring opportunities to leverage existing city-owned infrastructure for public transit and good movement. So I don't know if you're aware, but the city owns a rail line called the Guelph Junction Railway. It runs from Campbellville all the way up to the Northwest Industrial Sector, and uh, it's a tremendous asset. Every uh, rail car takes three transport trucks off the road. So when we're looking at that from a traffic congestion perspective or from an emissions perspective, um, that's a great thing for the city. And there's also an opportunity because we own those corridors and we own that infrastructure to explore it for personal rail, for pub um, public transit. So we'll be looking at that. And then also we've identified that we'll have to come up with some additional um, recommendations in this plan to continue advocating for inter-regional transit. We're hearing that loud and clear that that is important for Guelph and where we're situated geographically, um, economically, our role as um, a smart city's hub for a circular food economy and agri-food agri industry and our connection with uh, Waterloo Region. So um, I've been interested to hear some of those interested in transit talks because I think there's some opportunities there that we can continue to advocate for. 
So that's where we're at in terms of next steps. We're now going to be busy with our heads down, working away on developing some of those alternative scenarios. Um, you can expect to hear back from us probably March, April. Um, it'll be more traditional, it'll be more of a public open house style where we present the findings and the different alternatives we're exploring and get some feedback on kind of what degree of ambition are we looking at in our preferred scenario. And we're going to present our preferred scenario to Council in July. And then following that, we'll develop our implementation strategy, which looks at you know, how much is this all going to cost and um, how do we prioritize and time the projects and that sort of thing for early 2021. So that concludes my presentation. Um, if you do want to be, um, if, if you do want to have comments or be engaged in this process, have your say.guelph.ca slash transportation. Um, it's closed for surveys and that sort of stuff, but you can view people's comments on the interactive map and you can still leave general feedback on, on the website as well and it's continuously monitored. So my email is, is there as well if you want to reach out. Thank you very much. We're going to take a 10 minute break.